The man cries out because his friends are tormenting him. Hello, my name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Today we do that. It is exciting from Genesis to Revelation. And on today's program, we'll talk about Job crying out that he is being tormented by what his friends are saying about him. And we'll explore all of this on Job coming up in just a moment. But Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Today we're going to be exploring some of the themes from the book of Job that help us understand the time period that Job was alive in. Very interesting period of time, and we'll talk about that. Plus, Rye is here with Did God Really Say, Ryan? Today we're exploring a supposed contradiction in the Bible about the placement of the planet Earth. That and more coming up later on. All right, the placement of planet Earth. This is interesting. What do you have? Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the importance of our words. This is all very interesting. So get your Bible out. Get your Bible guide out. If you don't have one, stay there because we'll tell you how to get one before the program's out. But let us study through the Bible as we look at Job and his book. Many researchers believe that historic Job and his friends would have known the history of a global flood really well. Now we're going to talk about why a little bit later, but first let's talk about what. Let's talk about this event and how it permeated cultures. It is a striking fact that nearly all cultures around the world have an ancient global flood story. Cultures separated by race, language, thousands of miles, and even entire oceans contain within their seemingly separate cultural memories a terrible story of an ancient flood. Many have tried to explain this phenomena by pointing to an innate human fear of natural disaster. It is guessed that due to the common human experience of occasional local flooding that can be disastrous, that these cultures separately invented their flood mythologies. While true that local flooding has been and still is a common occurrence in many nations, and also that small stories or myths have a tendency to grow and change over millennia into something much more grand than how they started out, this theory has a tremendously difficult time explaining the small corresponding details between all of these myths. If all of these stories grew independently of one another, then why do so many of them refer to a one person or one family survival, the building of a large boat after a warning, the rescuing of the animals of Earth by this person or family, animals used to check the recession of the flood, the boat landing on a mountaintop, and the purpose of the flood being God's displeasure with activity on the planet. If all the flood stories were different, then a theory of their origin from localized flooding would be sound. But that isn't the case. These stories come from every part of the globe. 
Could it be that all of these myths represent an event that actually occurred? A common history would explain the similar subject matter, thematic themes, and specific details. The Bible claims that after the Tower of Babel, a great split of humanity occurred, each family branch leaving to find their own land. As time went on, culture and history developed, but they all carried with them a common early history of the Great Flood and the creation of the world. Now, there are a few different methods and things that we use to help us date the book of Job to get an approximate age for not only its composition, but also the time period when uh, what is recorded would have taken place. Now, Job is, a, is, is really unusual for a book of the Bible. Uh, and some of the reasons for that is uh, because Job isn't necessarily an Israelite. There's no mention of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And before Abraham, there were no, before Jacob, really. There were no Israelites. Abraham was the founding father of what would become the Israelites. So this really helps us to identify here that Job is either contemporary with, most likely contemporary with, or just before the time period of Abraham. Another way that helps us to date this book is the topics that Job and his friends really focus in on have to do with the early history of mankind as recorded by the Bible. Pay attention to it, and I bet you'll be able to see. Torment. That is the word that Job uses to describe what he feels about his friends. They are tormenting him. Bildad the Shuhite confronts Job and explains that he must confess of his evil for God to hear him and to help him. Well, Job's response is also stepping up. He claims that his friends are tormenting him. It is important for us to be wise when we see someone who is troubled. We must never be quick to condemn. We must comfort. Unless God has spoken to us about that individual, we must be wisely constructive not unwisely destructive. Job 19, verses 1 through 15. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment my soul and break me into pieces with words? These ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you have wronged me. And if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. If indeed you exalt yourselves against me, and plead my disgrace against me. Know then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. If I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. He has fenced up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness in my paths. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. My hope he has uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. His troops come together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed, and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. Job chapter 19, verses 1 through 15.
The scripture is amazing. And Janice reads the scripture beautifully. And it's awesome. And we have just read part of the scripture from the book of Job. And I think it's classic. And as we look at this, we are focusing on Job's response to his friends and his response to the situation that God has put him in. Now, let's remember that Job is in this particular place and his friends come and, and they saw him and they didn't speak for seven days. They were so blown away by what had happened to him. And remember why it happened. God said to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan said to God, that's because you've blessed him. Take away his blessings and he'll curse you. Take away his health and he'll curse you. Well, God allowed Satan to do that. But Job has not cursed the Almighty. He cries out over and over again for permission to find God and to seek God. So this is really, really interesting. And as we look at this, beloved, we need to consider this for ourselves. Now, there are four points. I'm going to cover three on this program. And the four points you can get a hold of through the Bible guide. And write for it. The address is coming up later in the program. I encourage you to get a hold of it. But let's take a look at what happens in this scripture one by one. And let's understand. The review says wisdom in words. Wisdom in words. Now, if we're going to keep up in the Bible, we're going to read Job 16 to 19. It's very important to read the whole Bible that you do that today at some point. It'll take you about 15 minutes. Now, our focus today is on Job chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. This is amazing. And here is the passage. Job 19, verses 1 to 5. Then Job answered and said, how long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you have wronged me, talking to his friends. And if I indeed have erred, my error remains with me. If I indeed, or if indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me. Job cries out to his friends and he cries out and he says, Job cries out that he is being tormented by his friends who are saying things to him. Beloved, we must be wise when we encounter people who are in trouble. And wisdom oftentimes is not a lot of words. Wisdom is allowing the words to escape being where you need to be, helping the person who is in trouble, doing whatever you can do, praying, but not using words to try to solve their problem. Now, I know that's difficult for some people. It's difficult for me because I like fixing things. But there's an important point in our lives when we come to a place, we see someone in trouble and we just need to pray. We need to love them. We need to let them spout off about what they're saying. And we need to understand that they are dealing with trouble and difficulty and allow them to express it. How, well, how wise is that is so important. Let's go on to the next scripture. Job chapter 19, verses 6 through 10. Know then that God has wronged me, he says, and has surrounded me with his net. If I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is absolutely no justice. He has fenced up my way so that I cannot pass. And he has set darkness in my path. He has stripped my glory, me of my glory, and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I'm gone. My hope has uprooted like a tree. Wow, that's amazing. And he blames this on God. Job is saying something here that's incredibly important for us not to really respond to at this moment. But his friends jump in. And it's important for us to realize that when people go through difficult times, they go through a death, they go through a loss, they go through a great and troubling time, they say things. And they say things about God and they say things that he did to them. But sometimes they don't mean them. And we have to give permission to them and we have to pray for them and ask God to help them, beloved. How important is that? And it is important as well if you go through difficult times and, and you've lost somebody, you understand and you realize. Remember that there will come this time when you will see the person again, when, when, when you come to the other side of humanity 
and you raise again and you see that individual, that will come and it will change. And so it's important for us to recognize. Job cries out that it is God who is troubling him, not Satan. We must remember there is a time of testing for everyone. Now let's go to the scripture again. He has also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. His troops come together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. Now look at this. This is important for you to understand as we go to the next segment. Job cries out that God has come against him, but he is surrounded by evil. He is not surrounded by God. He forgets. He didn't even know in the first place. You see, the problem is, and the difficulty is, oftentimes when evil surrounds us, we think that's God. When God pulls his hand back, and I want to tell you something, in today's world, he has done that. In many countries who have rejected God, who've said, we don't want God, we want nothing to do with him, God has pulled his hand back. And he stood back and he said, then, then you okay. You deal with what you want to deal, and God protects individuals who love him in that country. But those who he doesn't, he pulls back, and he says, you're on your own. How important is that today? Now, there will come a time when God will not do that. There'll come a time when God not only pulls back, but when he demands and cries out for judgment, Revelation chapter 19, and Jesus Christ comes, and the word of God judges, and that will be a different time. It's coming soon, but it'll be a different time. But in this case, Job sees and he understands that it's evil around him, but it's not. It's Satan around him and God has his life in check. He says, don't take his life, Satan, but he allows this to take place. And as we consider this and as we wonder about this, keep in mind that God has his hand on Job. Job's poetic language, it mentions storehouses and oceans of ice and snow. Now this might be hinting at a mystery from our past, the Ice Age. The Ice Age is so accepted as historic that it has made its way into our textbooks, movies, and children's stories. The aftermath of it can be seen all over the world. Stony residue of glaciers long melted still pierce our landscapes. Foreign stones dropped by melting icebergs still stand as faithful witnesses. So how do scientists and historians explain this to us? They don't. To them, the causes for an ice age remain a complete mystery. But what about those of us starting with the Bible as a source of real history? Does the Bible contain a viable cause for the ice age? Many Bible-believing scientists and historians have begun to think so. Basic requirements for an ice age are cooler summers to stop ice and snow from melting, warmer bodies of water to promote evaporation in the colder temperatures, which would lead to more annual snowfall. The history of Noah's flood, as described by the Bible, accounts for all of these requirements. The volcanic activity of the fountains of the deep opening up would not only create much warmer oceans, but as demonstrated time and time again, volcanic eruptions release an enormous amount of ash and particles into the atmosphere that block a lot of sun and take a long time to dissipate. After the flood of Genesis 6 through 8, the earth was changed. In many areas, the earth was shielded from its normal amount of sunlight by volcanic ash and debris. The oceans were warmed by the fountains of the deep, evaporating more water in their long cooling down process. The stage for the Ice Age was set, not in a day of primitive man, in a day when mankind had to begin again, building their lives from the ground up. Perhaps this explains why we find early man living in simple camps and even caves. Perhaps cavemen weren't primitive at all. Perhaps they were just beginning again.
placed into the very center of the Bible is the book of Psalms. It's a book filled with praise, prayer, promise, and deliverance. Psalm 33, 7 says of God, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Our newest Psalm CD, Prayer and Promise, is now available. Listen as I read a collection of psalms along with the beautiful piano accompaniment of Jean DeVries. This is the third and final addition to our collection. For your copy of our newest psalm CD called Prayer and Promise, please send a suggested gift of $15 or more and ask for your copy. If you would like a complete set of all three CDs, please ask for the Psalm Triple Set for a suggested gift of $30 or more. Contact us today. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And on the next program, I'm going to be speaking about this. Job cries out that wicked men and women seem to be successful and they seem to do well. And he cries out, why, oh God, why? And we'll talk about that and more coming up next time on the Quick Study Television program. Right now, Ryan is here with Did God Really Say? Today we're going to be exploring an alleged contradiction in the Bible, and here's the question. Is the earth resting on pillars, as 1 Samuel 2.8 says, or is the earth hanging on nothing, as Job 26.7 says? Let's study. Bible cynics claim that there are many errors and inconsistencies within its pages. But are there truly mistakes in the Holy Scriptures? One of these supposed discrepancies has to do with the placement of planet Earth. In 1 Samuel 2.8, we read, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. However, in Job 26.7, we read, That God stretches out the north over empty space, and that he hangs the earth on nothing. At first glance, these passages do seem to be in conflict. After all, how can the earth both be resting on pillars, while at the same time hanging on nothing? First, we need to realize, says commentator Eric Lutz, that a true contradiction would be more like hangs on nothing versus hangs on something in the same time and same relationship. Second, these two passages, when taken in context, are clearly written in a poetic form with the purpose of creating a mental image. Clearly, the earth does not literally rest on pillars. The pillars here are representing God's power, which is literally upholding everything by the word of his power, according to Hebrews 1.3. Likewise, the nothing the earth is hanging on represents the unseen forces such as gravity, which are upholding the earth. We should never interpret everything in the Bible in a wooden literal sense, otherwise confusion will arise. Instead, the Bible should be interpreted using what's called the historical grammatical hermeneutic. This means that we strive to understand the author's intended meaning, whether literal or figurative. The historical grammatical hermeneutic recognizes the fact that figures of speech are used in everyday language as well as in the Bible the purpose of which is to give a more interesting look or to help the reader understand better the concept being expressed. A modern example of this can be found in the phrase, she is the apple of my eye. Obviously, there is not really an apple on a person's eye, but rather the apple represents somebody beloved. Just like the poetic pictures in the Bible, it is a truth with a figurative meaning. You know, there's a lot of confusion that arises because many people don't extend the same graces to the scriptures as they do to our own modern language. Now, no one denies that we, with our modern language, use word pictures all the time to get our messages across. And just like our modern day language, the Bible also uses word pictures, sometimes to help us grasp concepts better. This in no way, however, detracts from the truth of what the passages are saying. May we then treat the Bible fairly, in doing this, you may be surprised at what you discover. Very interesting. You mm -hmm. know, Ryan, these segments, Ryan, are excellent. They're very good. Um, I, I've been watching them, and they're very, very good. They are. So uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about it next time. Okay, so yeah. what did you study? Well, you know, our assigned reading for today was Job 16 through 19, and I focused in on 19 for this particular segment, but I backed up and looked at 
chapter 18 because Bildad is talking to Job. And he starts out in 18 chapter 1, that's Bildad, and he says to Job, How long till you put an end to words? Gain understanding, and afterward, we will speak. Well, Job turns that around, and in Job 19, he answers him back and uses similar phrasing in verse 2, and he says, How long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with words? Well, how many of us remember, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Who came up with that? That is so not true. Words can hurt, and because words can break or crush someone's spirit, our words should always be considered and weighed before uttering them. We must be so careful with the words that come out of our mouth. I love the verse in Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Actually, the entire book of Proverbs 15 is a good read. You should read it for yourself. Ephesians chapter 429 says this, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. What an excellent word to give you today uh, in the program. Be careful what you say, because what you say can hurt somebody. Yes, it can. And uh, that's very interesting, and it's uh, important for you and I to know that. And by the way, make sure that when you uh, write to us, you ask for the Bible Guide. And our address is on the program, and we've given it many times. But BibleDiscoveryTV.com is our website. Many times we misunderstand the evil that happens to us and around us. We think that it's God. This is often because we are untrained in spiritual war. We must remember that we are in a fight. And sometimes the fight is hard and sometimes the fight is victorious. But a few times in life, the fight will be hardly survivable. God will cause us to have victory in every situation if we understand that evil is fighting us. We read in the book of Daniel that the angel was held back by those demons who were infesting the very property Daniel was praying for. We must understand the truth of spiritual war when we continue in this life. It is great to tell you about Jesus Christ. He brought you this program today and he died on that cross 2000 years ago and rose again so that you could have a choice, that I could have a choice. I, I chose Jesus Christ years ago and I want to encourage you to do the same. Pray to him and say, Lord, I, I need you and I want you in my life. And when you pray to him, let him know that you need him desperately. And when you do, write to us so we can send you information from the Bible on who Jesus is.